Hey, everybody. This is Ron, and thank you for tuning in to Ron Talks Tabletop Super Show Sunday. And I have a, a new guest here for this Sunday's episode. Would you like to introduce yourself? Of course, Mr. Rumble. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Lee. For those of you who don't know, or other people know me as Johnny Korea, or my new persona I'm working on is Jonathan and Korea. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Rumble. Oh, anytime, anytime. And if you folks don't know by now, that is my gimmick name, Mr. Rumble or Ron Rumble. People call me that in the community. So thanks for coming on the show. I know that you have a lot of experience with um, deck building and deck tech. And I just wanted to bring you on to talk about that kind of stuff, pick your brain for a little bit and, and just have a little conversation. But first, how did you get into hobby gaming in general? That's a pretty easy question for my generation. Uh, I was a 90s kid, right? So growing up on the Saturdays, we had a lot of good shows. I forgot what, it wasn't Cartoon Network. I think it was another uh, provider, but it was Pokemon, it was Yu-Gi-Oh! So I was watching those a lot. And then naturally when the card game came out, that's when, you know, I started getting a little bit at school, you would collect the Pokemon cards, you would play your own made up elementary version of the game at lunch. But that's pretty much the gist of how I got to hobby gaming. Like okay. at least my first foot in. Got it. Got it. And uh, how long you've been doing that? Hobby games in general, I guess. How old am I? I'm 31. I started probably when I was like eight or nine. So in and out about 22. Is that math? Math work? 22? 20? Right. Something like that? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, what what games do you like? I mean, aside from Super Show, because this is a Super Show podcast that we're talking about here. But aside from Super Show, um, what card games do you uh, like? Card games besides Super Show. Um, I used to be a big, big fan of Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, people would call it now Edison format, a GOAT format. That was, like, my prime. I don't know if poker counts, but I love playing Texas Hold'em. A poker counts. You know, I love playing Texas Hold'em because there's so many nuances to the game. I could talk about that forever, but we're in a Super Show podcast. Right. Um, I guess Catan technically is a card game, if you think about it. Yeah. Technically. Um, and everyone loves a good game of Monopoly, but that is a whole different ball game, right, Mr. Rumble? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, like, nobody actually plays Monopoly according to the rules. Yeah, everyone has their slight twist. Like the elementary Pokemon, everyone has a slight twist on how they play their version of Monopoly. Yep, exactly. But getting into Super Show a little bit. So how did you get introduced to Super Show? And um, what are the things that you really like about it? So we'll do a little dive background, background diving. Um, when I first met Piglet, it was in middle school. We played a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! And about moving towards high school, we were playing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! About 2015, I moved away from Georgia. I came back 2021, and of course, I got to see my boy Piglet. First thing he says when we're hanging out is, like, hey, do you want to play this game called Super Show? I was like, what is this? Matt's like, it's this game I demoed at, I think he said, Origins 2020. So he opens up the New Japan boxes, which I didn't know back then were worth good money now. But we just started playing. I started with Kota Ibushi. He started with Okada, and we just kind of sat there. And I was like, oh, this is really fun. So we we just kept playing over and over. And that's how we started. Cool. Were you into pro wrestling at all? No. And I'm adamantly about this. I enjoy watching wrestling if it's on the TV, like already, Mr. Rumble. But I will not go out of my way to watch it. So I don't really care for the whole Roman Reigns things these days. Like, I'm a big John Cena mark. But that was pretty much everyone my age growing up. Yeah, so you know, I, I was asking that question because I know that there's folks in the community that are you know super into like you know indie wrestling and going to live shows and all the kind of stuff, and then there's people like me who pretty much wrestling is a TV product. I do watch you know WWE and AEW, and actually I watch it a little bit of MLW as well. That's on YouTube or what have you. But I'm not into going into live shows of the indie scene. No, no disrespect to my friends. And then there's folks that don't watch wrestling at all. They just like the game. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I tell people all the time, like, I got into the game because I enjoyed the game itself. The game is a very fun, as uh, some of my friends say, it's a very fun beer and chips kind of game, right? Like beer and pretzels. Like you can just get in there, whatever you want. It's not too serious of a game some days. If you want to take it, you can. But yeah, on the wrestling aspect, I'm not the greatest fan. Like 
It's just a really fun game, Mr. Rumble. Yeah. And I just want to say that for the folks that are listening to this podcast that aren't into Super Show, that haven't tried it or anything like that, you do not have to be like a wrestling geek to play this game. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, so you've been playing for a couple of years and you've had experience with, with other card games like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! But in your, your mind, what makes Super Show different from those other card games that you've experienced? Okay, so I'm going to dip into a little bit of a Yu-Gi-Oh! talk, a UFS talk, and then we'll get into why I think Super Show is so unique. Go, go for it, yeah. <laughs> um, I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is 40 cards. Don't quote me, I think it's a 40-card deck. I played anti-meta in Yu-Gi-Oh, so for people who don't know, you can build your deck however you want with three different cards, monsters, spell traps. I built very anti-meta, so I would always play triple decree, triple solemn judgment. I would play a bunch of quick spells, and then I played little beaters. So uh, it was like Suzuki Samurai number four, Elemental Hero Wild Heart, Cyber Dragon, Jinzo, um, and then like the Warrior Toolbox. I played anti-meta because I just wanted to poke you. So Yu-Gi-Oh! you can play back then a variety of ways. Same with UFS. To me, in UFS was very fun. I guess it's called Universes now. But you can ask Keenan Meadows or Piglet or Matthew Turner. Um, I liked going fast. I had a motto, Mr. Rumble, called Scoop on Four. For those who don't know what scooping means is you scoop up your cards and you call it a day. You forfeit. In UFS, I played Fire and I wanted to go fast. I did didn't get to go to Worlds, but shout out to my boys in Canada, Mike Lowe and Danny Funk. We were going to play a team's event at Worlds called Scoop on Four. We were going to take this seriously, Mr. Rumble. We were going to sit across our team, and if we did not win on our fourth turn, so turn one we set up, turn two, turn three, turn four, we're throwing attacks. If we did not win on turn four, Mr. Rumble, all of our team would just scoop up our cards and just call it a day. Wow. So yeah, Scoop on 4 never happened. So now we're going to Super Show. The biggest reason I think Super Show is so fun and exciting is because across from me, if I'm playing Mr. Rumble, in theory, I know what all 1 through 30 cards are in your deck. Like on a basic idea, if I'm playing Mr. Rumble, I'm assuming his 1 through 3 is stops. His 4 through 6 are stops. Some of them may be a little variety of stops, but they're going to be stops. 7 through 9 is going to be some kind of recursion shuffle back draw. 10 through 12 is going to be maybe tech pieces draw. 13 through 15 are going to be stops. One being usually a very powerful stop. 16 through 18 is going to be same thing. Recursion with maybe a tech piece. 19 through 21 is going to be stops. Or this is where you have to be careful. Some powerful cards also in the 19 through 21 slots. 22 to 24, the most overloaded follow-ups in the game. So I need to be careful there. And then typically 25 through 27 are stops. So the fact that I know what should be in your deck is what makes this game so exciting because now we are playing the mind game of navigating each other's decks. That's why I think Super Show is exciting because you can follow that meta or shout out to Coach Chuggy, you do not follow that meta. Right, because it's Chuggy, as I've had him on a previous show, subscribe to this philosophy called Florida Agra where you're just trying to push the tempo and uh, get to a finish as quickly as possible and hopefully overwhelm your opponent. It's an exciting style of play. It is very exciting, and I will say this, Mr. Rumble. I don't know if you're doing Rising Stars. If you get Coach Chuggy, see how I say coach? Chuggy yep. was my first coach in Rising Stars. When I first started playing this game, he sent me a very aggressive Florida Aggro-style deck list for Witch Hunter General. When I first started the game, I could not comprehend the level of that deck. Nowadays, I can see why he gave me that list, and I might try that list, but... For people who are starting, Coach Chuggy may seem a little aggressive or out the box, but I would suggest the new player going under Coach Chuggy to try that deck because he sees the game differently. And every little local has their own meta, right? Mm -hmm. Our meta at ACCW is a little different than Florida. Florida is a little different from TVA. I'm pretty sure Deep South is vastly different than Tri-State. Same thing with Midwest Coast. Every region store has their local meta within a meta. Yeah, exactly. So is it like that in other card games? Because I don't know. Metas within metas? I would assume so. Um, I think, for example, like, let's say me and Piglet were playing at BNR games back in the day. I'm pretty sure back then people were running heavy warrior toolbox. So then people were teching for tool warrior toolbox back then. But if you took your warrior, the anti-warrior toolbox to maybe a regionals, you're probably going to walk into a whole different ballgame, right? Yeah. So I guess... Depending on the story, that's probably meta within meta. I know at one point in TVA, guys, I think Chuck 
Trey and Drew came by once. They're like, why is your meta so colossal heavy and power 10 heavy? I'm pretty sure the answer was because Piglet was playing Piglet so much. And people were like, well, if Piglet's playing Colossal, I want to play Colossal. I think I counted it. I think one Locals, when they came by, we had six Colossal Smashers in our meta. Wow. I didn't even pay attention to that. but No, yeah. I pay attention to a lot of the things that our players play, just so I can get an idea. And then um, I called it, like, I have more competitive decks, the ones that are more serious and a little more NPE. So I don't tend to play those. So I look around before I uh, choose my competitor and like, okay, I'll choose a more casual competitor just to not try as hard on certain weekend events. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And uh, I know other people that are like that too. You know, there are certain events where they're definitely going to try hard and there's other events where it's like, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to play this deck. You know, it's, it's competitive, but more importantly, it's, it's fun. It's not going to, it's not going to cause an MPE. Um, yeah, that's the next ultimately the... for those that for those that wonder what MPE means. Yeah, because I do think Handberry is very underrated in this game, but I'm not gonna sit across a Sunday event and rip Mr. Rumble's hand the whole game, and he's sitting there watching me play Solitaire. That's not fun for him. That's not fun for me. But if it's a CAC, which to me is the highest prize in this game financially, it's a nine hundred dollar mm-hmm. prize. I'm going to pull out all the stops and bring out the most NPE deck, and I want Mr. Rumble to watch me play Solitaire. But that's a whole different story. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, just like uh, other card game tournaments have those high uh, cash prize or high value tournaments, and so you're going to see the best of the the best that people bring. So that agreed, makes a whole lot of sense. Agreed. So Brian, how do you approach building a deck in Super Show and then and uh, playing the game? Take all the time you want. We have plenty of time. <laughs> okay, Mr. Rumble. This was the the chunky part. I was looking. I did. I did a quick glance last night, but this is where the chunk of the, my figuring of the interview would come out yeah. so when i build the deck i first look at the competitor which i call incremental advantage i'll use johnny korea as an example the whole time today johnny korea says when your turn roll is at least two less than your opponents you get plus one this gimmick doesn't seem very huge right mr rumble it's just a very small plus one occasionally right but the reason i like this is called incremental advantage i did the math i think this gimmick steals about four turns on four instances of when we would bump, I usually get the turn. Okay, let me ask. So four turns out of the whole game. How many in the game? Yeah. Um, um you, I usually average about thirty. So about yeah. every thirty rolls, I get four turns my way that I shouldn't have. Yeah. So normally in any game, four turns is a huge difference, and that's the same thing in Super Show. Four turns. If you think about the late game of this game, four turns is me passing, bearing, finish stop twice so i'm now ahead of you four turns in the late game if we get there right so i look at gimmicks first the small incremental advantages then i look at finishing power so johnny Cruz instance is sub 10 power 9 strike 8 in theory according to the stat line my strike should be the best my sub should be second my grapple should be third when i design johnny korea or my strike finishes 10 three nines according to my sub 10 then my submission is a bottom booster plus three plus three on my power nine. And then my grapple is two tens on a strike eight. So the theory here is at crowd meter one, my strike is 11, three tens, which is most of the times guaranteed kill if I hit a 10 or 11, right? Right, yeah. Crowd meter two or higher, my finish sub now lowest rolls a nine. The other five are kills. So I like Sharpshooter, which for people who don't know, it's if your roll is less than five plus two. So the lowest roll you can roll is a seven on crown meter zero. My finish sub is the exact same thing as that. It's plus three to the five and six. The lowest roll I can roll is a seven. But it's a little bit better statistically because there are some steps you get into that change the way your rollings work. Finish uh, Sharpshooter does not have that stat, where my 2200 mob stretch now gives me stats. So now that I've looked at that, I'm like, okay, this works. I now play what I call Brian Lee style or Bob Dunn style. All the yellow cards in my deck in Johnny Korea will be recursion that are proactive recursion. Right. So my one's a stop. I've been tuned. I've been working on that. But one's a stop. Four is a flip kick. Why is it a flip kick? Because I want to force champion to Kickstarter to make unstoppable. So late game, I can pass and bury and then play flip kick to get a lead and pick up a card I want. Seven is going to be that's going to leave a mark. Proactive recursion. Ten is going to be. I think I'm testing. Uh, the air raid crash line is it air raid crash? If you have an elite shuffle one, yep. Um, yeah, shuffle and draw one. Shuffle and draw one. My 13's a stop. 
My 16 is Steel City, and we'll come back to this point. My 19 is a Skullduggery Potion 19. My 22 is she uh, Sheepish Flying Knee to the Skull. And my 25 is Standing Moonsault. These are all proactive recursion pieces. And then my subs are all reactive. Three, I'm testing Lockjaw. Six, Big Body Block. Uh, nine is Face Stretch. 12 is, I think, Arm Stomp. 12, 15 is a stop. 18 is Mop Twist Clutch. So earlier I said Steel City versus Mop Twist Clutch. I have two types of card play, proactive and reactive. Proactive being, I feel like I'm in control. I can get this across. Reactive is based on what my opponent's board state looks like. So I'm playing my second strongest recursion, 18, reactively. Because if I play it proactively, if you don't have a stop Mr. Rumble, Mob to his clutch does nothing. Yep. So yep. I'm now playing 18 reactively. 24, I like to play um, Stand Ankle Lock right now, just to see what you have. And then 27 is freeze up move. And then my weakest spot grapples, I play all draw or tech pieces. So two is the draw stop. Five is rejected with steps. Eight is takedown, draw two. 11 is Japanese arm drag. 14 is seven seals. 17 is legendary monkey flip, tech piece. Because there may be a card or two that your opponent has that you don't like. And especially at 17, people tend to play APOC. So if I'm trying to clear the board, I'm going to play legendary monkey flip because it's either going to give me an advantage on board state or someone's going to have to stop it with APOC, most likely. And then 23 is Death Valley Driver because I'm not playing my 23 late game due to opponent's stat lines in the 13, 14, 15. 26, self-explanatory taunting. But that's the way I build the deck. So all my yellow cards are proactive. All my purple cards are reactive. And all my blue cards are going to be either accelerating or tech pieces. That's the way I usually build a deck in about five minutes to get an idea. And this works about 90% of the decks. It only doesn't work in like berry or keywords or specific decks that are forcing against the stat line. Because I'm playing with my stat line. I'm playing with my sub 10 power nine. Right, right. And that makes sense. As you were talking about this, just for a little bit of clarity in this game, there's a concept of protection. And so like there's submission and technique skills. You typically will have skill stops to stop strikes. You want to be looking at, if you have the advantage there, then that's a protected move line, strikes. So when Brian's talking about all this stuff, he's talking about with Johnny Korea, the strike is his most protected move lines. Yeah, so it's a rock, paper, scissors effect for people yeah. who don't, or for don't know how to play the game, but strike stop grapples, grapple stop subs, sub stop strikes. There's a little rock, paper, scissors element in the game. But the most impactful stops in people's decks are 13, 14, 15, which are based on your number in a certain category. Each finish, you can throw approximately three times before it'll usually connect, but you can cut one of those out and go two times if you're playing with your strong numbers. So if you can play with, like, my 10 versus Mr. Rumble's 9, his 13, 14, or 15 does not work. So I'm playing with my strong 10 as my, quote-unquote, best finish in the deck. And so I'm now forcing that card. Yeah, so let's talk about playing the game. You talked about your approach to building a deck. You're sitting across the table from me. You've shuffled up. You've drawn your cards. What's the approach from there? Um, so I call, or there's three stages, early, mid, late. Early game, I want to say, is about the first five to ten rolls, depending. Mid game is about, about turn 10 to about 20. Late game is what I typically, is when I think is we're both decked out. Early game, Mr. Rumble, I just chuck cards, chuck cards. If they stick, they stick. If they don't, they don't. Other than stops, which I'm holding... I'm just going to chuck whatever I got. If I have a number seven, that's going to leave a mark with nothing in discard. I'm just going to throw my number seven. After that, if I don't have a follow-up, I'm just throwing one of the 16, 17, or 18s, or 20. I'm just chucking them to see if they stick. In the late game, same thing. Finishes, I'm just throwing whatever. It doesn't matter. Strike, sub, grapple, I'm throwing them all. I'm just throwing whatever I think can stick onto the board to get advantage early, because early game is a crapshoot, because we have three cards starting. And then once we get to the mid-game, now I'm thinking a little bit, okay, now that we both have about 10 cards or 8 to 10 cards, Board has developed a little bit. Now I'm thinking with the stat line. When it comes to the, the end game, I'm strictly playing according to the stat lines. I'm playing yellow, yellow, purple, or purple, purple, yellow. I'm trying to make sure you only have one stop for me. That's the way I try to play end game. That makes a lot of sense to me now as opposed to a year ago when I started playing. I wish blind tech would keep going, but I'm just so busy with work. We explain a lot of these processes there, but this is a great little, little interview I can explain to people. And then the other thing I want to tell the people is just because... I'm saying this is the this is the way to play. No, at the end of the day, you can only stop a finish three times. 
some cases four times, but most of the time three times. If you like a competitor and you like a finish, you just need to chuck it three times, and then on the fourth time it's going to connect. So don't listen to me if you like to play the game your way. Like Jessica Havoc's a great example. I think she has a grapple. No, she has a strike agility really bad. Yes, she has a agility five, strike seven. But Jessica Havoc finish says plus one to grapple, so it's two tens. Your finishals are plus each stop your opponent has. So you're getting plus two across, Mr. Rumble. This finish is huge, but it's technically her quote unquote weakest finish. But if you throw it enough times, Mr. Rumble, it's going to connect. It's going to murder people. Right. Yeah. So, so. I tell people like if you like a finish, you just need to work a little bit harder. Every finish is viable in the game. I will say Steve does a very good job. Most competitors are pretty much viable in any setting. It just depends on how much you want to work harder for it. That's a great thing to know, folks. It's the only TCG that I'm playing, I mean, aside from Star Wars Unlimited right now, but in my limited experience with TCGs, knowing so many friends that play a bunch of other TCGs, this is the most fun one out there, just because of the community and really just the gameplay. Now, not everybody's trying hard all the time. We're just, you know, we're just out there playing to have fun. And there's a time to try hard, for sure. You know. And the greatest thing about this game is because it is a TCG with the dice factor, no matter how much I build or tech, Mr. Rumble, we could play today and you could beat me in three turns and we could just call it a day. And you can, I shouldn't be upset about it. You shouldn't be sad or happy. It's, it is just a part of the game. There are, have been stompings and people have received stompings. Like it just happens. Yep. So as long as people understand that factor, it's a great game. Sure, yeah. will you be frustrated at the dice? It's going to happen. It's just part of the game. So you just live and learn. It's like, okay, I lost in three, whatever, move on. The dice are the great equalizer. So Brian, you're part of a team that was uh, called Project Fighter. Ah, I guess yes, it was supposed to be eight folks, but it ended up being five, where your task was to examine all of the singles competitors in the game at that time and rank the most powerful ones. Super sure as it stands right now, they have these different divisions. And the top two divisions are the World Division and the Underworld Division. World having 32, Underworld having a 64, so there's a total of 96. And then every other competitor is put in a thematic division, whether that's like for United States, which is kind of a catch-all. The old school, which is homages to old school wrestlers. Global, which is like actual real independent wrestlers that are wrestling today or have wrestled and so on and so forth so i know that that's a huge task there's a lot of strong personalities in that room that you meet in to discuss these things in your opinion like what is your role in project spider and how do you think that it's working so mr rumble the five people in project spider are myself drew madsen bob the brain dunn grump and paul reno the role i would play is it's an interesting dynamic this is the way I perceive it as. So you have Grump and Paul Reno who are very old school, I call them. They've been playing the game forever, the vets. You have me and Drew who are the new school who came in a couple of years ago. So we have vastly different opinions. And I call Brain the Bridge. This is the way I look at the dynamic of Project Spider is you have two guys who played... Three guys, Brain's played forever too, but Grump and Paul Reno seem to me to have the most strong opinions on certain things. And then me and Drew have strong opinions but they may be different and then brain is usually the one either bridging it or he's the deciding factor on some of the votes so i think me and drew are mainly there for a more different glance at the same subject the way i look at a competitor is more going to be similar to drew looking at a competitor whereas poor rainer looking at a competitor may be more similar to grump and then brain usually can see depending on how he sees things right so everyone has their strong opinions and it's hard to get ideas across sometimes example was our first project spider drop there was a lot of things we missed and a lot of things people were upset about but i will defend it and say some of the competitors we were not placing in certain spots we were told were going to be errated but they were not errated because of project spider so don't blame me people don't blame johnny korea johnny korea is just listening to the the top dogs but my job on project spider is to try to get my opinion out there and we have to fight about it sometimes not fight but like strongly repeat it because everyone is so strongly engraved and, like, the examples I give people are, like, everyone knows Snake Pit's broken. Like, it's a starter deck. It wants to do well. Steve wants new players coming in with Snake Pit to have a fair chance. But, like, some competitors, me and True didn't get to see the terror running across back then, right? So, like, Theo the Greek Neo. Chris Pate was very good at Theo the Greek Neo back then. But me and Drew Madsen never saw the terror that Chris Pate did. But the other three did. Another example. Sorry, Pate. I'm calling you up on this one. X-Royce. <laughs> me and Drew never saw Pate run amok 
ruining people's days playing old x Royce. But the other three did. x Royce got eroded, so it's not as bad. But, like, there are some competitors in the game we did not see running amok due to either the meta or the cards being out. So me and Drew are a little bit newer in that term. So we have a different viewpoint on certain competitors. So that's the way I say Project Spider works. You have your two old guard, you have your bridge, and your two new guard. That's the way I would say it works. I appreciate the insight. That makes a whole lot of sense. A lot of people have very strong opinions one way or the other. Some folks think it's a great thing. Others think we don't need it, just errata competitors or maybe book um, competitors for certain events. But like, I think it's been a very positive thing overall. There was some concern about, you know, how is this going to affect the local scene? And I know here in Atlanta, it hasn't really affected the local scene. The most stringent thing that I've heard uh, John, our GM, say is like at our tournament, it's like, okay, if you're a veteran and you're playing one of these top 96, you get to the top cut, then you're going to get a stipulation, which heavily implying that that stipulation is going to be negative for that competitor. But I don't think that that's a bad thing. No, I don't think it's a bad thing either, because just the sheer amount of quantity of competitors in this game is if you can't find something you like that's not in the top 96, I think you have a problem. And like most of the top 96 aren't independent wrestlers so i know hodges for example loves danhausen if danhausen was snake pit for example and he had five snake pits built we might have a problem mr rumble right but he doesn't have five snake pits built he has five danhausen so i'm not gonna blame a guy who loves a certain wrestler that's part of the game you have a wrestler you enjoy you're going to play that wrestler no i think hold the line here has done very well in terms of filtering out what needs to be played, what's allowed to be played. And if you want to play anything, you technically can't play anything at ACCW. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the way it should be. All right, so Brian, um, what's coming down the line for you in your various roles? And uh, and I know that you're in the, like, the faction, the big picture and everything like that. So. Um, so what's coming down the line for me right now, I want to say I'm working on Jonathan and Korea to get into the game. I think it's a funny gimmick. I have a, a mock-up. I just need the funds. But that's personally what I'm trying to do is get Jonathan and Kareem into the game. Other than that, me and Piglet are the new LFF Tag Team Champions, so we want to have the most dominant reign we can. And then in terms of the big picture TM, we're going to try to win Faction Wars this year. We made it to top eight. We lost to Just Business. So we're going to now tune up, get ready. The boys have a little more experience. And this is for anyone playing Faction Wars. It is a grind, folks. Don't expect to go into Faction Wars and just be ha ha he he. It is a grind. You're playing a competitor, as people like to say, you're pregnant with a baby for nine months. You're playing this competitor for nine months. Pick a competitor you enjoy and get ready to think of all the different decks you can build. There are one through 30 cards printed. You have to build a deck that you think can win against two other booked competitors. So when you sit across from a snake pin and a raw raw parry, make sure you know what you're doing. Because when you're playing, I don't know, Johnny Korea and you're facing against Snake Pit and Ra Ra Perry, you got to pull out all the stops. Because Faction Wars is a long, long grind. Other than that, Mr. Rumble, I think that's it for me, right? Oh, wait, I guess Atlanta Cat coming up in November. But LFF title, Jonathan and Korea, big picture winning Faction Wars and winning the Cat. Yeah, that's about it. All right. My last question that I ask all my guests. Brian... What is one interesting thing about you that people may not know about? What is an interesting thing about Johnny Korea that people do not know about? Um, I guess the most interesting thing that people will not guess is I am a classically trained French chef. I don't like throwing that term out a lot because I haven't worked in the back of a kitchen in a while. But I did go to culinary school, so I have an associate's in French cooking. And then I have a bachelor's degree in food and service, food and service management. I used to be on the line more, but just the way my life is, I think front of house is a little more fluid. Um, but I used to help catering. I staged at some sushi restaurants. I staged at um, some French restaurants. Staging just means work for free to get experience. There's nothing impressive, folks. And then I worked kitchens for Korean barbecue, Southern barbecue. And then I had a really fun one at uh, brunch. But yeah, um, your boy Johnny Cree can cook. Oh, wow. That's a useful skill. In it my- is, Mr. Rumble. It is. All right. Well, we got to make some arrangements sometimes. So. Oh, of course, Mr. Wait, Rumble. Just wait. let me know. Well, um, Brian, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Rumble, for having me on. And folks, for you at home, the CCC, let's get Mr. Rumble to the game. It is the Rumble summer. It is hot. And as Mr. Rumble likes to say, 
Get ready! Thank you for having me on, Mr. Rumble. Oh, yeah, dude, anytime. Thanks for listening to the Ron Talk Tabletop Super Show Sunday podcast. And until next time, see you later.